Welcome, friends, to this uh, second day of our three-day event in Rice Lake, Wisconsin. I'm very happy to see you all again. I'm very happy to see your interest in the subject of great importance. If you look at this subject carefully, it's the most important subject one can have to work on in life. Because other things we do in life stay here. What we're talking here takes us out of here into our true home. We don't belong here. This is a temporary place we came. We came for a temporary experience, a different experience, an experience we could relate to, which we can relate to our true experience in our true home. Our true experience is one of love. And we have come here to see if love still works in the midst of other adventures that we can get involved in. These very adventures we came just to compare with our own love became our distractions. And we got so immersed in these distractions, we got so attached that we forgot altogether that we only came for a temporary visit here. And we thought we have settled down here. There is no other place to live in. This is the only reality. And we got caught up in that. But when we get tired of this adventure, even though we have no knowledge that there is any other reality, even then we feel this is not our place. When that feeling comes, this is not our place. What is working here does not appeal to the inmost self. Inmost self means not the body, not the sense perceptions, not even the thinking mind. Inmost self, where we have the deepest experiences which we call seeking the truth. There's something inside us, beyond the physical body, beyond sense perceptions, beyond the mind, beyond thinking, which leads to a feeling we are seeking for something which is the ultimate truth, compared to which it looks that we are in a temporary alien place. That seeking comes from our soul, which is our true identity and our true reality. But since the soul is covered by these three covers, the cover of the mind, which functions like a body around us, the thinking mind is like a body, and we even name it the causal body, the causal self, because all things are caused by the mind that we are experiencing here. And it expands further into diversity of experiences when we divide the perception of the mind into sense perceptions. And the very single perception that would give us everything, we divide into seeing, touching, tasting, smelling, hearing, separately. It diversifies the way we can experience. And when we put it in a body, it creates the experience of the many with greater reality than the experience of the reality, <coughs> than the experience of many would be if we didn't have such an isolated material differences between us. We are all made differently in our bodies. We may have many things common in our sense perceptions, but many of them are also separate. Our minds come from the same source, but there's a lot of differentiation there. What has made differences in the mind is the background that we are carrying of memories of so-called past lives. I call them so-called because we may have or may not have lived them. We had to get so-called past lives because this particular experience of being a physical human being cannot be created without a cause, a cause being a series of events that have happened earlier to which this is an event, an effect that we are experiencing now. Therefore, even if we had no past life, to create this life, we had to have a shadow life, a notional life, which had all the causes to create this life even if we came for the first time. So therefore, we are now in a state where the law of cause and effect is inevitable. That means we are working only in cause and effect. You take away cause and effect, time disappears. Everything will disappear. That is why the law of cause and effect is the most important law 
generating an experience in this physical world. It's also called the law of karma. Karma is only law of cause and effect. It's not different. The difference that we see is that the mind that creates this law of karma also holds the memories that are associated with the events of our life. And that is why it's a big storehouse. The mind is a big storehouse. It comes with a storehouse. And since our bodies look different, our destinies become different because of the memories that the mind holds. So a variety of experiences generated by different bodies, different memories being used to sense perceptions, all happening in the domain of a created three world structure the physical world, the world of sense perceptions, and the mental world. These three worlds have been created for us to have a temporary experience. All these three are temporary. One is more temporary than the other. Physical body in a physical world is the most temporary out of these three. But there are other forms of life which are even more temporary, like the life of an insect which is also the soul experiencing a different form of life. The experience of a, a bacteria in the body, which has very few life. There are some amoeba in our life which have nanosecond lives, very short lives. And then there are some trees growing in the forest which have thousands of years of life. They all vary. The forms of life, they are calculated to be about 8.4 million forms of life which the soul can manifest. Human being is only one of those four, one of those 8.4 million. And that is why this is a very unique situation where we can discuss these things in a meeting like this only in the human form. You will never see any other form of life having a meeting like this and discussing how to go back to a true home. Because all other forms accept that where they are is their true home. An insect accepts that's their true form, and that's their true form. Even angels, who are also forms of life, which are invisible to us, and, and inhabitants of higher le levels, not yet made that material, also are forms of life. They all accept that is the form of life for which we exist. Only human beings say, we are not sure. Is this really our place? Or is our home somewhere else? Do we belong somewhere else? That is why human beings are the only one single form of life in 8.4 million forms of life who seek something higher than what they're experiencing. And that's a great thing. Therefore, when human beings reach a point in their diversified experience in the three worlds, they want to find out if our truth is beyond these three worlds. And when the seeking reaches a point where we say, now we are tired. We really want to go back to home. A system that has been set up by ourselves to go back home comes into effect. What is the system? What arrangement had we made that in case this happens that we get tired of the experience and we want to go back to home? The system set up is a perfect living master. A human being with direct contact with our true home at all times will appear in our life. When he appears, he's just an ordinary human being, and we are still confused by the mind that is creating all our experiences here. We are still caught up in the trap of cause and effect and paying off karma, getting rewards for good deeds we have done, getting punished for bad deeds we have done. We are still in the trap when such a human being appears in our life. We can't find him. The only way to find him is to seek him inside yourself. When you seek inside for the ultimate, he appears automatically. If he does not know where a seeker is, he's not a person with that awareness. That is why such a human being appears in our life when we are ready, no matter where we are, no matter what condition we are, he will appear as a human seeker of the truth. When he appears, he comes to take us back to our true home because he is in the true home at the moment when he is in the human body with us. There is no other difference. There is no other difference between a perfect living master and ourselves, except 
his awareness is continuously available to him of all levels of creation, including our true home. A person who has had a glance or a glimpse of a true home and comes back and tells he had a glimpse, he's not a perfect living master. He may be very advanced soul who has had higher experiences and he's come back into the same reality to tell us what's happening. A perfect living master is in constant touch with the true home at all times, 24-7. And that is why when he comes in contact with us, he speaks with the authority of one who knows, not one who has learned or who has found out what happened. No, he's one who's speaking from direct awareness of what he's talking of. And that is, makes a big difference. But more than that, what affects us is that he touches upon the very things which our seeking is, is looking for. And he eventually touches our soul with his love. The only thing that comes in the way of our being pulled by that love is our thinking mind, which has been endowed with a lot of good capacities. It's the best computer you can find in the world. Our modern computers will never match the computer already existing in our heads, our mind. And that mind is thinking all the time. It has so many safeguards built to prevent our being dragged into more negative forces, more negative, negative entities, negative experiences. It checks them out by a process which is called, we call it doubt, skepticism. So the mind is continuously having doubts and need, needs proof and certainty about everything, which is a very good thing. So the mind is doing its duty, performing its function by creating a doubt. And therefore the mind doubts, how can an ordinary human being like ourselves take us to a true home? How can an outside person help us with what is inside us? How can we be sure? How can we be sure he is really a perfect living master or a fake person pretending to be one? All these doubts come into our head. And it's natural to have these doubts because it's a screening system. We screen this and as we are screening it, we find another thing happening side by side. And what is happening is we are being pulled by the pure unconditional love of a perfect living master whose love is not flowing from the mind, sexes, uh, and things that we use here, but from the true home itself. The true home is love. And the love that we experience with the perfect living master is flowing directly from there. So it's, it's a different experience. And when we have that experience, it increases slowly, depending upon how much burden of old memories we are carrying, which we call old karma, how much heavy a burden we are carrying from old times, from old previous lives, and depending upon how much work we might have done to clear that karma earlier and now, depending upon that, the time frame is set up by which we are pulled by that love, and eventually the love overcomes the doubts that we have. And a conviction comes, then, Mind still wants proof. Mind says, I know I am being pulled by love, but I might be still mistaken. We may be just going the wrong way. How can I be sure? I want proof. And then the proof comes. How does the proof come? The same way, like when we wake up in the morning, we are sure we are awake. We never ask more proof than that. When we wake up, I have never seen any person. Thousands of friends, I have asked them, when you wake up, do you call people to tell that you are awake? Or do you pinch yourself? Or what proof do you have that you are awake? But you know for certainty. A certainty with no doubt. A proof that is built into the experience of waking up. And what is that proof? The proof is, when you wake up, you remember you went to sleep. As simple as that. That's all that happens. Waking up does not mean opening your eyes. You're lying in your bed. 
you went to sleep. You forgot your body, you went to dream state, you went into a silent state, and when you woke up, your eyes are closed, your body is still lying in the bed, in the same way, you know you are awake. What has happened? How are you so sure you are awake? Because you remember you went to sleep in the same bed. There is nothing greater, nothing greater proof, a greater proof for oneself than the experience of a proof contained in the event itself. And that's the proof of waking up. When we go towards our true home and awake to the next higher level of wakefulness, the proof is contained right there. We remember we were there. It does not mean that we are going to a new place. People think that we, maybe we are making a journey, there are a lot of places on the way. No, we are waking up to a place where we were already. Not only one times. Not only do we get the proof when we awake to the astral plane and find that we were in that body, astral body without a physical form for many hundreds of years, thousands of years. This proof is there and no knowledge that the memory comes back that you went to sleep from there and physical body was merely a state of deeper sleep. But when we go back to a true home, we know we were always in the true home. We never left it. We just generated an experience of different forms of adventure that we created right there. And we are woken up to a true state and true home. The proof is right in the event. The proof is right in the experience that we get. Therefore, there is no greater proof than that that you can have. Nobody has ever asked for greater proof. But if you haven't had that proof, if you haven't woken up, you can argue for a long time. I once had a dream that I met a friend of mine. And he said, how can you be sure that we are dreaming? I said, I am not sure, but I feel it. It is all dream. And we said, let's try and wake up, wake up ourselves. So we said, let's push each other, do something, and wake up. And we woke up. Not really. In the dream, the waking up was also part of the dream. And we were not sure if we are awake. But when we actually woke up, there was no friend, there was nobody. It was just one person dreaming. And one person dream. If in a dream you see thousands of people, when you wake up, you will never find more than one person dreaming. How come that? How is that? You see many people in a dream, and you wake up, you are the only dreamer. What about the others? They were part of the dream. You will be surprised when we wake up in our true home, we are the only one. We are all created from there. And in a dream-like way, we are created by many for adventure, for experiences. This is a very real knowledge anybody can get who is a seeker and wants to find it. And it's all lying inside us, not outside. And the meditation we are trying to practice is a way of getting some proof of wakefulness, nothing more. We are not trying to go somewhere, we are trying to get proof that yes, we are truly not in our true home and we can awake to our true home by getting rid of a current experience through awareness. Awareness. How much we are aware at a certain time. Right now we are aware only of the physical world. This is our only reality. When we pull ourselves from this reality, by pulling ourselves from the experience of the reality, by using devices given to us for that purpose, three devices. One, consciousness, which makes us have the capacity to be aware of things. If we had no consciousness, we could have no experience. Everything we're having is because we are conscious. We are alive and conscious and can have awareness. Consciousness is a potential. Right now, I may not be thinking of another place, but when I want to, I can think. So I have the capacity to be conscious of something that I'm not being conscious of right now. Consciousness is a great potential of awareness of anything that you want. Anything that you want. It's unlimited. The potential of consciousness to be conscious of something is totally unlimited. And that is why I sometimes try to describe our own true reality, our true home as 
totality of consciousness, unlimited totality of consciousness, which can be conscious of anything. And when it becomes conscious of something, it's a creation, it's a created thing. This whole universe, all levels of creation are based upon the single principle that consciousness can be conscious of anything. When it becomes conscious, it generates the experience and that's called creation. That's how all creation has taken place. Great thing that we are all conscious. And in the wakeful state, we experience it because we are awake and conscious. And we have awareness. But awareness is limited. Awareness is limited to what is present awareness. That means we are aware we are sitting in this hall. We are not aware of what is happening elsewhere in the world, what is going on elsewhere. We locked it out to be confining our awareness here only. So awareness is limited consciousness. It limits consciousness to what we are experiencing at a particular time. Awareness does include our thinking of something that's outside. That becomes part of our awareness, not part of our sense perceptions. So therefore, awareness is a wider term than sense perceptions. We can be aware of something and not have the perception through senses of that particular thing or particular place. So that is why we have consciousness and limited awareness, and then we have the ability to be aware of things which are not in our sense perceptions. And then we can have another wonderful capacity we have called attention. Consciousness limits to awareness. Awareness is limited by attention. We are aware of everybody, but we can put attention on one thing. We read a book, we put attention on the book. We are working on a computer, our attention is on the computer. So therefore, attention is a capacity to restrict ourselves to any kind of awareness that we want. Whatever attention, wherever we want to put attention, becomes our limited awareness. Right now, our attention is scattered. It is scattered from where? Where we are. Where are we, as I explained yesterday, at the third eye center in a physical body, that's how we feel. We talk like this, we are at the third eye center in a physical body. If I tell you the truth, I don't know if you'll follow it, we are not anywhere, but we are creating the experience of a space-time in which we are creating an experience of the physical body around us and of the whole world around us. The truth is very different, but difficult to understand the truth. Somebody has written me five emails discussing this particular subject that one saint says the truth cannot be told. And that saint says he went to my, to my master, great master, Baba Savan Singh, and said, Master, I don't want to be a master because I can't tell the truth, and what good is it if I can't tell the truth? And my great master said, the truth is, even I can't tell the truth. The truth will never be understood by people. The truth that what we are calling a third eye center is not a location at all, is a creative power from where Awareness is being scattered through scattered attention, first generating the experience of our mind, then generating the experience of sense perception, then generating the experience of a physical body, then scattering itself through the physical body, then through the physical body scattering itself into a physical world. Who will understand it? But that's the truth. Therefore, we say the other way around, by accepting the untruth as the truth. The untruth is the world is not the world is real. That's the untruth. The world is real. It's been created independently of us. We have just come temporarily into this world for a short time. Everybody understands that? The untruth is easy to understand than the truth. Therefore, they, they were right. Both masters were right. The truth will not be understood because our mind capacity to understand is very limited. And that is why it's very difficult just to give one little concept. Can our mind understand that the whole of the universe we are seeing is not only coming from a source which has zero time and zero space? Of course, scientists are also first defining the black hole like that. The black hole has no 
space and time. Everything is flowing out of it. They will space and time. Even they can't understand how everything can be contained in things. Gautam Buddha, 2,500 years ago, said the whole universe has come out of nothingness. And then he goes on to say, nothingness is not empty. It contains everything. Is that our concept of nothingness? Can we understand it? Truth cannot be understood at this stage. When you realize the truth, it becomes very clear. Then you know what it is. So that is why we talk in certain untruths, because that is fitting our current experience. Our current experience is, world exists, we are sitting in it, we are moving around. I was recently in China, a very wonderful Buddhist monk, who had been practicing meditation all his life, sometimes two, three days continuously at a time. I admired him for what he could do. And his, his question was very simple. And his question was about this very point, that can we discover the value of shunya, which Buddha speaks of? Buddha says, if you want to find the truth, go into nothingness. And millions of Buddhist monks today are trying to find what that meant. I've been to so many Buddhist monasteries, they're trying to find, how could Buddha say that? Buddha said, nothingness is a secret. So what they are interpreting is, forget you have a self. And they can't, the one who forgets is the self. One who tries to forget is the self. The self can never be given up. Self never goes away, no matter what. And they think that nothingness means go, give up the self. He had a very nice discussion there. So this issue has not been understood by larger religions, like Buddhism. And they are all talking about Buddha's teaching. What happened to Buddha? If you look back at his history, he was trying to talk of shunya or zero or nothingness as the source of all creation. But people didn't understand. So he began to say, I want to teach you the eightfold path. Right thinking, right action. Everybody understood it. Everybody understood what we should do here in a physical body. Nobody understood how it's all happened. This way to find how it all happened is to go within and awake to your highest reality. Now, I have said that we have the facilities. We have consciousness, which is our source all the time. We have awareness, which makes us conscious of certain part of that awareness. Then we have attention, which we can place wherever we like. But most of the time, for many lifetimes, we have used the power of attention to place our attention on the experience we are having. We never placed our attention on the experiencer. Who is having the experience? When we tried to say who is having the experience, we put it down another experience. My body is having the experience. The body is the experience itself. My mind is having an experience. The mind itself is an experience. We never touched upon who was the real experiencer, what was the real self. Now, we can put attention on the real self too. And this is what perfect living masters come and tell us. Put your attention on the real self, not on an experience of the self. Even the body, the sense perceptions, the mind, everything around us, the energy centers, all experiences. Who is having the experience? Who is the real self? The real self is the one who is having the experience. How do we find him? Go to where you are having the experience. Experiencer can't be somewhere else. The experience is being generated in this physical world, in this physical body, and apparently in the head, in the center, and the third eye center. Therefore, withdraw your attention to the third eye center. Not focus it there. If you focus your attention, you are away from the third eye center. Whenever we focus attention on anything, it's away from us. Focusing attention, putting attention, concentrating attention on something leads us away from ourselves. Withdrawal of attention brings us back to ourselves. There's two different things. We never learned. We learned a lot of focusing of attention and education. In growth, in our daily experience, never learned how to withdraw attention. 
and the secret is the withdrawal of attention. But there are some aids for that too. Not only do we have the power to concentrate our attention where we like, including ourselves, the other facilities we have to withdraw attention. And the greatest is to imagine where you are. When you imagine where you are, that's a self-imagining where it is. If we say, I'm imagining I'm flying, the same self which is imagining it's in the body is imagining it's flying. Therefore, when you imagine where you are, you are really withdrawing attention. When you imagine you are sitting at the third eye center, you are really imagining where you really are at this time. Therefore, it acts like a withdrawal of attention and different from focusing attention on something or trying to put attention somewhere. You don't try to put attention. You feel, where are you? And you close your eyes. Here I am, right in the center. So when you can imagine that, you will have a very successful meditation session. Yesterday, I told you how to go to that place or have a feeling you are there and not to try to see yourself there. Some people are still seeing, and I said many of my friends have seen, kept on seeing themselves for decades and got nothing beyond that. They were stuck and never got a clarification that seeing yourself is not yourself. Seeing yourself means you've created something else other than yourself. Be the one who's seeing. Pull yourself back to who is seeing and imagine that's where you are. So when you do that, you are able to reach yourself. What happens when you try that experiment? Some of you were able to do exactly what I'm going to tell you yesterday. Many, of, many more will be able to do today. When you imagine you are where you are behind the eyes at the third eye center, your own self radiates the energy of consciousness which at the physical level in the physical body appears to be like a sound. That's wonderful. That means we can hear ourselves. And that is why I said the yoga that was taught by great master Baba Savan Singh is called Surt Shabd Yoga. The yoga of putting attention Surt on the Shabd and getting union with your true self. Surt is attention, Shabd is sound. Lot of indication has been given to us by all religions, the founders of religion to this truth. In Hinduism, they believe that the Veda were the old ancient text where you could find the truth in the Rig Veda dealing with creation. It says the Nard created the world. And the Nard was the ultimate <coughs> creator. Nard we saw. The, in the Bible it says, in John's Gospel, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. All things were made by him. And nothing was made that was not made by him. Very clear. In the, in the Guru Granth Sahib, Sikh scripture, it says very clearly, Shabde Dharti, Shabde Akash, Shabde Shabad Bhaya Prakash. So everything was created by Shabd, the sound. And even Shabd was created by Shabd. It manifested like that. All the, you go into any, even Islam, the, the definition of the kalma, the creative power, of the sound is mentioned. You go into any of these original teachings, you find they're all referring to something that can be heard. You call it word or sound, the real reason is both are audible. And this self of ours is audible. We can hear it. There is nothing better than to be able to hear our own self and go with that hearing because we have a capacity to listen. We have many capacities. And we are confining our capacity to listen to only the ears. That's very minor. When voices outside come and we listen with our ears, that's only for local use here. But when we imagine we are hearing something, it's not hearing with these ears. we hearing with inside. Even if we went higher, the capacity to listen would still be there, even in higher levels. So that is why listening is very important and we have the capacity to listen. And the best thing to find your own self is to listen to yourself. 
today we will do that. Listen to ourselves. Now I want to mention what you are likely to listen to. The method to listen is the same. We can use any method. I just said, said yesterday, use the repetition of mantras and words. If you repeat them with the mind and listen with the soul, you are moving toward the soul. Soul is always the listener, never the speaker, never the thinker. Mind is always the speaker, always the thinker, never the listener. Understand, these both fit it into our head. If you listen, even to what the mind is repeating, you are approaching the soul. And if you merely repeat and think of something else, it's only the mind working, soul is nowhere there. Soul is only giving life to this activity. So that is why listening is important. But when we are able to listen to our own generated words, which are the words we get as a mantra, or word we coin up, coin up as a mantra, like I just said yesterday, listening to it brings us closer and closer to our own self. When we try to listen in actual practical meditation, we find there are many other sounds also coming up. Some sounds are coming from the reverberation of the sound of the self. Some sounds are coming merely from the physical body. Some sounds are coming from the astral sense perceptions. The different sounds that are coming, they are sounds around the self. But the sound that comes from the self comes from the center. Same place where the third eye center is, right behind the two eyes in the center between the ears. That's from where the sound of the self comes. As we approach that by imagination that we are there, sound can be heard. Everybody can hear. We all have the sound. If you start hearing it, it will take second, any time later on, to switch and you can hear it. Then it will be heard all the time, 24-7. You know that your soul exists because there is sound. And that sound, <laughs> if you approach it very close, can be very loud, but you can drop a pin here and also hear the pin. It has nothing to do with these ears at all. These ears still function the same way as they're functioning now. Their sound is totally different, can be heard inside. And that sound is a secret. But the sound looks like sound, like physical sounds, resembles the physical sound. In the beginning, it can resemble like the sound of a bell. <coughs> Big bell. The kind that we put up in the churches in the belfry, and the dong, then the echo of the sound keeps going dong. It sounds like that. Comes from the center. Later on, the peal of the sound increases as the dong part is gone, and dong, the echo part goes on. Sometimes we catch the echo sound right in the beginning. Sometimes we have caught the other sound in the past lives, and we very quickly catch up that sound. People have slightly different experiences at what point they catch up, what sound they catch up. But once you catch the sound, listening attentively, you're putting attention now, listening attentively to the sound withdraws your attention to the inner self faster than anything else that you can do. And listening to it is not like the kind of effort we make to repeat something. It's very different. Listening is far more enjoying something that is happening rather than you trying to get something. So listening to the sound is not so much of an effort as enjoying something happening somewhere. We go to a concert and we hear the songs, the music, the sound. We don't make effort to hear it. We enjoy it. It just comes, we enjoy. And that is how the meditation becomes when you are using the principle of the sound current, which is all emanating inside. You will hear it sometimes very low volume, far off. Sometimes it will come closer. Sound is not moving anywhere. It's in the center. It's in the self. Our attention is moving. We are not used to putting attention, withdrawing attention. We are used to focusing attention. And therefore, the practice needed is to hold the attention to the sound, and it becomes louder. And you hold it, it pulls you. 
you suddenly feel you don't know where your body is gone. For those who are really serious uh, meditators, I want to little give a word of caution. It's not necessary to hurry up through these things, because when you hurry through this, it looks like you are dying. And some people have got so frightened, they have stopped meditating. They write to us, we were scared, we didn't want to meditate. Your meditation kills us. <laughs> I never kill you. It's called dying while living. Dying while living has been mentioned as a process of finding yourself. And in, in the Bible, Paul says, I die daily. So this is something very different from physical death. I must tell you, uh, my own dad's experience, who was his disciple, he was very impatient. Might have been American past life, I don't know. <laughs> so very impatient, wanting quick results. And he was waiting for this opportunity, and he meditated a lot, and almost died in the meditation, said, never meditation again. So scary, it kills you. So he went back to great master. Master, what you taught me, very scary, I am frightened, I am not going to do it anymore. Great Master said, why are you afraid? It's a way of finding who you are, you are not the body. All you are finding out is, that the body is not you. He said, Master, how am I sure? It looks like, our first of all, looked like when the body became unaware, I almost th thought I am going to suffocate. <laughs> then I felt that my body is gone, I am moving out of it, I, I have no body. Terrible feeling. Great Master said, take it easy, step by step. The word he used was darje by darje. So, go step by step, very slow. First say, now the feet have gone, now the hands have gone, now legs have gone. Slowly, slowly, you will understand nothing is going, it's just an experience of withdrawal. Then he said, what do you think would happen if you really died, he said, I have faith that I would see you. He said, doesn't that faith help you at all? <laughs> he said, let me tell you something more practical, statistically. <clears throat> People can die any moment, even natural deaths. Isn't it surprising that nobody has ever died, even physical death, during meditation? Isn't that some good statistic for you? <laughs> then my father got a little satisfied. And then he did stage by stage slowly. Now when this experience happens, the sound can pull you very fast. And even if you, if you find the sound pulling you, no other method of meditation is required. One method is good enough. What will happen? This sound, which is like a bell sound, we call it bell sound because it has got a, in the beginning a hit. Dong. Then the dong part goes away, continuous happens, and sometimes when compared with the blowing of a conch or something like a whistling, like a very heavy whistling. So that continuous sound that goes on inside, <coughs> that sound then pulls us to the next level, <coughs> where the sound becomes almost a mean of communication. You suddenly realize the sound is the self. And then you find that whatever you can think with the mind, with the sound, can be understood by anybody around you. What we here call telepathic communication. Telepathic means a person says, whatever I think my friend in Germany can no understand. But they don't tell you, if I think in English, the German can understand German too. But that's the truth. If, you have, if any one of you experienced telepathy, you notice that it's not the language which you are using that is conveyed by telepathy. It's the meaning of what you intend to use the language for. That's conveyed and can be understood in any language. And that's a normal way of communication at the astral plane inside where there's a much larger world than this physical world. That itself is a great experience. If you can visit that regularly, you will find it's a great place to visit. And that's how bodies have no weight, there is no matter. <coughs> you can fly, fly very fast. Yesterday, imaginary exercise was merely 
to give you a sampling of it, there's a normal way there. You can do research in the subjects you're interested. You have whole life. You see a lot of people doing that who are dead here. So it's a great experience to, to have that experience. But if you are able to meditate in the same way, not in the third eye center of the physical body, but the third eye center of the inner body, which is equally well located in the same place where you feel you have the eyes to see and you have seen the, there is an ear to hear. Same shape we have of the astral self with no weight, no molecules, no atoms in it. Otherwise, exactly the sense perceptions are located like they are located in a physical body. When you want to put your attention in that body, you can. You can meditate in the inner body like you can meditate in the outer body. When you meditate, you become unaware of your sense perception. <coughs> and you open up a completely different way of perceiving. You perceive everything together. Suddenly you see, you can hear light. And you can see music. There's no difference. The mental capacity of perception is total. It's not divided. Just for diversification, it divided into sense perceptions. Therefore, we have a second body upon ourselves, the astral body. Otherwise, the mind can perceive totally the same way. And we reach the ele element of the causal plane. You will also notice that in the astral plane, when you go first, that you can see everything because there is no total darkness there. There is no strong light even. When you imagine things, what kind of light do you see it in? The same. As I said yesterday, you close your eyes. Some people even put their bands on their eyes yesterday. And they could still see light. They could create light just with a switch. What you see there is an inner light, like a twilight, which is always there. That's why everything is visible. And it also looks like that the everything has its own light. That's why you can see things in the darkness. So sometimes they refer to a radiant form of life there. There are the things. When you see your own master there, who will always be there if he's a perfect living master who's initiated you, you'll see him in what they call a radiant form. You can see him even in darkness. Radiant form does not mean he's emitting lights and we are seeing it. It only means he's visible with no light. So that radiant form of the master that appears can be seen appearing, disappearing, appearing, disappearing. Nothing. He is not doing that. It's our attention not staying stable. It's so drawn to scattering outside. Over practice, we'll be stable and we'll be able to talk and be with your master like you are on outside in the physical world. That's a very big, very big point in effective meditation because after that, you are with somebody who is at all levels. And as a person, as a manifestation, as a personification at that level, he becomes your friend outside and inside and guides you to every level. There are some souls who are so fascinated by the experience of the astral plane that they forget that they were saying, we want to go to our true home. When they reach there, that's beautiful. This is our true home. If the master is not there, you believe that's the true home. Compared to this, it looks like the true home. And many masters are stuck there, thinking we have reached such khand. That is true home. Everything is beautiful, wonderful. We fly without body. And we have heavens there. So it must be a great place. But if you have perfect living master with you, he says this is a temporary stage, just like the physical was a temporary experience. We have to go higher. Now when you meditate with the inner body, the sound changes. This sound, which we are using here, I'm using it now, I'm speaking to you in sound. This sound can be spoken and read. So we call it Varanatmak Shabd. That means a sound that can be spoken, heard, being used into language. <coughs> the inner sound of the bell is not spoken. So we call it the unspoken language or unspoken sound, which also we call Dhon Atmakshab. Dhon means a continuous sound. So from Varanatmakshab, which we are using here, 
So dhonatmak shabda usually has to explain. When we go with meditation to the higher stage, we go to different kind of sound. A sound that looks like we have always been hearing it. It doesn't look we just started hearing, like this sound can. Dhonatmak we feel we just started hearing when we go there. When we reach the next one, looks we never stopped hearing it. We were always hearing it. We just awoken to the fact that we didn't know we were hearing it, but we were hearing it all the time. That is why even the name of the sound is changed from Dhunat Makshav to Anhad Shabd. Anhad means no beginning, no middle. Um, all middle, no end. Anhad, no be beginning and no end. And it, it's an experience. It's not just a description of a sound. Some people just use it, Anhad Shabd. It's an actual experience of a causal plane where you feel a sound was always being heard by you and you are hearing it always in that state. But when you go beyond the causal to our spiritual region, there is no sound as such because there is no space-time at all. It's a totally different, indescribable state. So the sound becomes Sar Shabd, which means the real Shabd, which means yourself. There you discover the sound was yourself. It wasn't emanating from the self. We thought it's coming out from the self. Then you find it was the self. And here it looked like it was a sound we can hear. A great experience. That comes only with the help of the love of a perfect master. We can go even beyond that. Of course, very few masters have gone. In, in, in the North India, where they call the masters Satguru, some were called Sadgurus. The original distinction was the Sadhu was one who discovered the soul. So Sadguru was one who can take you to the state of discovering your soul. He could be a real Sadguru. We also class them as perfect living masters. They take you to your immortal soul. Sadgurus. Then there are Satgurus who say even a soul is a creative thing. Your totality is one. Just to make the totality into an experience, souls have been created. They take you to where the oneness and the manyness exist together, which is our true home. And therefore, <coughs> the sound has been called, described as Sat Shab. Sat Shab, Sat word, Sat Naam, it's been called as the ultimate truth, that the true word is there. And the Sar Shab is the real Shab. Below that is the Anhad Shab. Below that is the Dhunatmak Shab. Here we're using Varanatmak Shab. All sound. But it doesn't look like sound when you find it yourself. Why are we calling it sound then? If we are discovering our own soul, if we're discovering the whole creative power, if we're discovering totality of consciousness, why are we calling it sound? Why are all the religious texts calling it the word, the sound that created everything? Only one reason that these descriptions are made for us here. And here that very thing which is not a sound but a creative power can be heard like a sound. That's the reason. And that's why we call it by these different words. We start by listening to the sound and discover within the sound the ultimate reality. Only a sant Sadguru who operates while in a human body with the awareness of the true home can take us to the true sound sound, which means because he operates from there. He is available to us at every level of awareness and we discover as we go on that he is higher and higher. Everywhere we go, he is still there with us, going together. There is no greater friendship that I can describe than the friendship with a perfect living master when you go within yourself. It's total 24-7 friendship. It's not meeting once in a while. 24-7 master is with you. And in all activities, once you have established that, you will feel it here also. Not only feel it here that he's always with you, you'll be able to see him, even physically. You'll be driving your car, he can be sitting next to you. You'll be walking on the street, he can be with you, he can be you, and he can be separate. There are beautiful experiences you can have through the following of that beautiful message which is coming through the sound, sound of the true self, coming as the sound of the soul.
becoming a sound of our reality inside this body. Let us see if how many of you can now hear the sound. I have just given detailed description. Many people don't even give detailed description of how the sound changes and how you can find the truth. I have given you all this information so you can practice be ready. Also, so long as space-time is concerned, it only exists in three places. The physical world, the astral or sensory world, and the mental world. Beyond that, there is no space-time. So space-time also looks like a sky. Just like we are sitting here, how do we know we have space? We can look out, huge, unlimited sky, infinite sky. We find infinite sky at every level. The infinite sky here is dark and light depending upon the sun, depending upon where the earth is, and we get nights and days. There are no nights and days in any other state. Nights and days are only in the physical state. In the astral state, it's always twilight, evening, morning, evening, no afternoon, no night. In the uh, causal state, the sky turns bright, beautiful, gold, orangish color, like if you see a sun setting, when the sun can be seen, when it's just setting halfway. Looks beautiful, gold, orange, gold, yellow, <coughs> that color you have seen the sun. Supposing you stretch that sun all over the sky, that's the sky of the causal plane. Very beautiful and very strong, beautiful golden light is there. And you experience it when you have the experience of the causal plane. Above that, you can't describe it, but just for the sake of a description and the untruth way that we are telling the whole story, they have said, since it's beyond that, if it were in space and time, the state beyond Brahm, beyond the creative power of the mind, par Brahm, beyond the mind, in the state where we as a soul experiences itself without any cover, the sky could be likened to the shining sun very bright, and put the whole of it in the sky. And that is why they describe it as the light of the inner real sun. Sometimes people have uh, used that expression, especially Egyptians use that, and some other people, old pharaohs use them. Many others have also did at that time use the power of the sun. But we started worshipping the sun outside here, many of us, thinking that's a description of this physical sun. But they are saying there is something which can be described as the whole sky being made up of sun. So that is one description. Of course, above that they say, because we have created something from there, all cause is there for everything that is happening here. So there has to be some secret place where the darkness also exists. Darkness is not an existence, it's the absence of light. But we should have the absence of light somewhere on the pathway, but what we're describing is more and more light. Where did darkness come from? There has to be a cause for this in a higher level. In the highest level with no space-time, but there is darkness. It has been referred in different ways, the great darkness that you go across. When, after you find you are a soul, and before you find your only one. This is properly placed, I think very nicely placed, between your discovery, your immortal soul, and before you can discover that you are only one, is a total darkness, so dark, that a soul which is compared to the light of <coughs> 16 of solar suns at that point. There's so much light of a soul, can't pierce through the darkness. But if you have the light of a million suns, you may be able to go. And a perfect living master has that light because his light is not coming from the soul point of view, from the other side. Therefore, he is able to take us through that darkness. It has been very beautifully referred to in some literature as a cave, dark cave, Kufa. And it's also described as a whirling cave, Bhamar Gufa is described the stage as Bhavar Gufa to show it is not only darkness, it's a revolving darkness 
So if you try to enter thinking maybe you keep straight, you keep straight, you'll get out the same way because of the whirling K. Just a way of describing physically something that's non-physical. So Bhavar Gufa is the state from which the darkness is pulled out. So there are many other factors that arise even at the top stage, the ultimate stage, where the seeds of all experiences that have been generated here exist in the totality of consciousness. That's a deep subject. And for those very keenly interested in understanding how the secret of all creation lies there can be found even now at that point, I can discuss with them separately. But right now we want to start from the beginning. So let's go back to the basics. We have to put our attention at the third eye center by imagining we are there. And we can repeat the words of our Simran or mantra or coined Simran, coined mantra, which we set up yesterday. And as you repeat, try to repeat with the mind. Replace thoughts with those words and listen to them attentively. The more attentively you will listen, the faster your attention will be withdrawn and you will be able to feel that you can hear the sound. If you hear other sounds, hear them just for practice. They won't pull you. I call them practice sounds. Sounds of chirping of birds, of chirping of crickets, or little bell sounds. All those sounds can be heard inside before you hear the big sound. Sometimes you can hear the big bell sound straight away also. Sometimes big bell sounds appear to be behind these sounds. These physical sounds appear to be closer to us than the true sound of the self. The self sound is in the center. These sounds can come from various sides. So play with them. Listen to one, then listen to the other, and then find out whether you can put your attention on the one coming from the center, appear to be coming from yourself, and you're surrounded by that sound. If you catch that, that will help you the most. The other thing that happens is that since we are differentiating between different sense perceptions here, particularly differentiating between sound and light. And at a slightly higher wakeful state, they are the same. Even in the region of the mind, they are the same. Therefore, sometimes people have had an experience of the light even when they could not hear the sound. Or they can have partial sound, partial light. Light and sound are coming from the same source. They are divided for perception only here and in the astral plane. The causal plane, they are the same. And that is why people may have some experiences of light or some type of light, some portion of light. It can be seeing some colors flowing. Some people see waterfalls of color flowing. Some people see just little sparks of light coming up. So which are also connected with the sound so sound and light can come together and many of these experiences, some people see light first, then sound comes. Some people see sound first, then light comes. Some see both of them together. So it depends upon uh, our elements. They say our elements, how grounded they are or they are not so grounded, which is the most prominent element. That's how the yogis used to explain that what kind of experience comes first. So there will be some differences in that experience. So don't think that they are really, yeah, I'm not hearing sound, but I can see the light is the same source. Or if you are seeing some colors, and some colors are only some parts of light. So white light or colored lights, they are all part of the same thing. They flow from the same thing. There are some colors that distinguish our state of awareness, state of consciousness. For example, we sleep at night and have a dream. Now, not many people know that the bulk of our dreams, more than 90% dreams, maybe more, are all monocolors. They're all in the color of the flesh. They're colors which is like reddish color, red, brown, pink, just flesh-like colors and the dreams occur in that color. And we don't see blues and yellows and those. But some dreams are more 
and tuned with the astral self coming in and participating in the dream and that they bring up these bright colors, especially yellow, yellow and blue, they come in those colors. The red portion comes in most ordinary dreams and the more colorful dreams, especially lucid dreams when you come, then all the colors of the rainbow can come in for lucid dreams. So the dreams are a lower level of awareness. When we wake up, we find it was unreal, it was a dream. Therefore, we consider it a lower level of awareness. But the colors play a role in that. The light breaks up into different colors and creates our forms and creates images. When you go to the higher levels, that some colors uh, become very bright, golden colors, colors of the uh, the shining, shining white colors, uh, colors, blue colors, violet colors, they become more prominent. So sometimes you can also know how far you are progressing from the change of colors when you are trying to see the sky inside. Now I would, if I tell you a little truth now, I hope you will not be disappointed. The truth is we have wasted our time two days. <laughs> this is not leading us anywhere. We are doing something so mechanical. How can this mechanical thing take us to a spiritual destination? But why did I waste your time and my own? Because our mind wants to waste time. <laughs> and mind loves to waste time. Mind loves to engage in time that is not really useful. <laughs> you know, every day we waste so much time, we have wasted little more time. But for the mind, it was good. For the mind, it made sense that here we are working towards something, we are going towards the self, we are finding out something, closing our eyes, trying to listen, trying to plug our ears, and we are trying to imagine something inside. We are working, we are making an effort to find something. But this was a mechanical exercise. The soul was not really involved. Did you notice that? What we did, body, senses, and mind were involved. And we want to escape from these three. And we are confining ourselves to these three. And two days we wasted only with the mind, body, and senses. And we were trying to look for the soul. Yes, that is because the soul lies beyond these. To reach the soul, <coughs> we need something different. We need love and devotion. That's true meditation. Love and devotion is the true meditation. But the beauty is that we can add love and devotion to what we have been doing for the last two days and make the whole thing useful. Therefore, we should now do that. Now, the best way to do it is, we have done some little practice in imagining we are third eye center in the center of the head, which is good. We can imagine we have things there, like a chair or a cushion, a place. We have imagined there's a place, place where we can stand and sit. So having imagined that place, that's good. That's place where we meditate. But let's meditate in the real way which will be useful to go beyond the mind by love and devotion. No, this, these are words. But if you love somebody, they are not words. If you don't love somebody, love is a simple word, L-O-V-E, yeah, four letters. The other four letters also, which are terrible. <laughs> but love is not so terrible, it's supposed to be good. L-O-V-E, it becomes a real thing when you are experiencing it. Now, to experience it in meditation, that's one great usefulness of having a master. A human being who is holding that awareness as a master, whose love you have felt, little or more, <coughs> whose love you have felt. We go to that part of our meditation, which is the most important, and we call it, in Indian language, dhyan. First is, First was merely settling down at the right place. Second was to repeat words. Third was to listen to the sound. 
Now we come to the fourth and the most important part, which is called contemplation of the beloved whom you love. And if you start there, all that we have been doing since yesterday becomes meaningful. And if you don't do that, it's a waste of time. So that is why let's add the real ingredient to our meditation by now not only sitting there, not only practicing greater awareness of being there, which is being done by repetition of words and by listening to the sound. You're really trying to pull yourself to yourself. Having settled there, now let's express our love and devotion for our beloved. If you have no master, but you love somebody, bring that beloved into your meditation. Even that will help you. Because love is love, no matter where it is found. The only thing is our mind contaminates it when we are experiencing it in the world. Thinking seems to interfere with the true experience of love. We think too much and the love disappears. But the master's love is never interrupted by any kind of thing because it flows continuously, unconditionally, with no change. That is why if you have a master whose love you have experienced, use that love and show your devotion and express your love the way you would, but sitting at the third eye center with the same process. So bring the process quickly by sitting there, repeating words, sound comes up, and then you express your love for the master. If necessary, invite the master to join you in the meditation and have an experience of a joint meditation with your master. After some time, you'll find if you have got a good master and you find that the master can be seen by your imagination inside, you can say, Master, I am tired of this mechanical meditation. Why don't you do this for your, by yourself? I'll just watch you doing it. <laughs> and do you know, master will do it. Imagine the possibilities. Now we are talking sense. Now we are, it's a meaningful exercise. So let's start that. So close your eyes, go back to the third eye center. The whole practice was to withdraw attention and know where to be meditating. And try to use your word to repetition, listen to them attentively, sound comes, listen to it. That will focus you not on anything, but withdrawal of attention to yourself. That will bring it up, no focus. You can use focus when you imagine the master. Because ma master will be seen by you. But you are still in the third eye center where you see master can be in front. It's still an experience. So long as you are at third eye center, any experience around you is okay. The third eye center is important because that's where you actually are in the wakeful state in the physical body. So remember your master, express your love, have a conversation. And when you have a conversation, you can forget the repetition of the words. If you have good practice, you will be able to later on, with practice, keep the repetition of words as a habit of the mind. The mind will keep on repeating 24-7. You can still have a conversation with anybody, including the master inside. But that takes a little time to practice. Mind struggles, mind meditates, mind likes to know where to go, mind likes to go, how to go, how, where, when, these are all mind games. And once we use the mind up to the point that the mind can help us go, it'll go willy-nilly, it'll go with some resistance, it'll try to draw our attention out, it'll do all those games. When we come to the love and devotion for a master, did you notice the mind kept quiet for a while? The mind was not disturbing too much. When love becomes intense, mind can, is completely can be ignored. And that's true meditation that will take place. How many of you were able to have a conversation with the master? How many of you heard the master speak? Beautiful, very nice. So this is how meditation should be conducted every day. It should be started with dhyan. And dhyan can be done, or contemplation of master being there can be done 
during the repetition of the word. It can be done during the listening to the sound. It can be done independently of both. It can be done when you are not meditating. It's all counted as meditation. Real meditation is exactly the experience of love and devotion that are pulling us even from here and preparing us much better for the space or lack of space beyond the mind. And that's where we want to really go. A true home is beyond the mind. These are all other mental games that we have to play a little bit because the mind will be very strong. Mind is very strong. It's a very strong force. And it's not easy to control it. So the mind wants to keep us completely outside with the physical world, want to bring the thoughts of the physical world over and over again, attaches itself more and more to the physical world has created a reality which is only physical. And that is why the mind is the only obstacle. And you must have noticed that when you meditate, the only obstacle is the mind thinking of other things. And when the mind can be ignored, mind can't be stopped. Some people say, we know how to stop thinking. I would like to meet such a person. <laughs> I've never met. One man claimed, he was a student in the university, and he claimed to me he has found a special technique, a special way to stop thinking. For that, I said, what do you need to do for to stop thinking? You have to adopt a particular posture of the body and then do some exercise inside and the mind can be stilled and stopped. And he said, that's what the scriptures say, still your mind. So that means you have to stop it, stop thinking. I invited him to my own apartment, this was in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I said, let's see how you do it. I'd like to learn it too, because I've never been able to achieve it, and I've never met anybody who ever achieved it. So that would be something new for me. So he came over, and I said, how long can you hold this? How, can you, how long can you stop thinking? He said, sometimes half an hour. I said, if you can do it for one minute, I will believe you can do it forever. Let's experiment for one minute. One minute is you do what you have to do, your te whatever technique you have learned, you put your body in that position. When you are ready to stop thinking, I'll give you a clap like this. That's the time to stop thinking. I'll keep my eye on my stopwatch for 60 seconds. After 60 seconds, I'll give you another clock. You start thinking again. Then we will really analyze what exactly happens to consciousness when mind is not thinking. It's a, big, it's a very big experiment for me to be able to find out what happens to the mind when it's not thinking. Does consciousness still be alive? Does it work in a different way? It's very important for me to learn that. So we will examine after you finished. He said, OK. So he convoluted his body and whatever he had to do. And then he said, I'm ready. So I said, wait for the clap. When I give a clap, then you stop thinking. So I put my eye on my watch, like a clap. I don't know what he was doing, but I was looking at the watch. <laughs> 60 seconds, second clap. Now you started thinking again. Let's examine what happened. Were you able to stop thinking for one minute? Yes. I said, let's examine the 60 second period. When I gave my first clap, how did you know that's the time to stop thinking? That's the first thought, first idea. After all, I clapped before that. You didn't know when the clap is coming. And I clapped and you knew to stop thinking. How did you know that? Don't speculate, don't figure out. Remember, this is some memory test. What actually happened just a few seconds ago? Tell me what happened. And he remembered. I remember that when you clapped, I said to myself, this is the time to stop thinking. And it looks like a thought to me. Sure. He said, it was only two, three seconds. In two, three seconds, I heard you 
and I said, let's stop thinking. And I stopped. I said, okay, let's cut the three seconds out. Now the experiment is only 57 seconds. <laughs> now you tell me, how did you know after when you stopped thinking that when I clap again, you will think again? After all, you were ready for it. And when I gave the second clap, you did start thinking. How did you know after you said, now is the time to stop thinking? How did you know <coughs> when I sec give the second clap, you can start thinking again? Remember, no, don't make up, remember. Remember. I remember I did say to myself that, and well, adding to the first sentence, I will stop thinking at the clap, and after he has, now when he has clapped again, I will start thinking again. I said, that looks like a verbal thought to me. <laughs> I said, then after that, how did you, you forgot all that, because you stopped thinking. How did you restore the memory that now you remember these words which you just said? <coughs> and he thought, and he thought, and he caught his head. Oh my God, I was thinking more in those 60 seconds than I ever believed. I said, how did you feel? Did you stop thinking? He said, I really don't know. I really felt I stopped thinking. I said, you don't know, but I can tell you when you felt that. Mind does not think in one channel. When we think something, there is a commentator on the mind sitting above it in a slightly different voice. We think in one word, another mind is saying how we are thinking. When we stop thinking in one channel, we think we have stopped thinking, mind picks up another channel. Not one channel. It can pick up second, third, fourth. And many people have picked up fifth channel during meditation. But mind you think one thing and comment upon it, it can have another slight voice. If not, it can figure out another person there thinking. And you are not thinking, somebody else is thinking in your head, you're looking at somebody. I said, mind plays these tricks. If mind stop thinking, it'll be dead. Thinking is the heartbeat of the mind. Like the heartbeat is for the body to keep survive, to keep the circulation on. Thinking is necessary for the mind to survive. Therefore, we never stop thinking. What actually happens is we can divert part of the thinking process to what we are doing and mind is still thinking. You know that when you were repeating words with your mind, mind was still thinking about how you are repeating and was remembering other things also from outside, not in the same channel, in a different channel. So what we can do is to learn to ignore the mind. This took me many years to learn after I was initiated, that to deal with the mind, you can't stop the mind. Mind will never stop. Mind will keep on thinking. The best way is let the mind think. You do your job, mind does its job. Why interfere? Put your attention on what you are doing, not the attention on what the mind is thinking. Shift the attention to what you are doing. You having a conversation, it's verbal, varanatma conversation with your master in meditation. Mind is trying to draw you somewhere else. Ignore the mind and continue what you are doing. Mind has many voices. And therefore, you can ignore the voices that distract you and stay with the voices that are with you. So to learn how to ignore the mind is a secret. In the beginning, it's not easy because the mind asserts itself as a self. We have, we have trained the mind like that. We can't blame the mind that we have ourselves said, I think that I am thinking. So therefore, we have become I is a mind. We have never said, I have asked my mind to think this. I am using my mind to think this. Never. I think. So we have identified our soul completely with the mind. We have not only identified with the mind, we have identified our soul with the mind, with the senses, with the body. This misidentification is the cause of all our problems. If we knew these are separate things we are using and we use all of them, 
to their capacity will be no problem at all. These are meant for using. It's meant to use them. A wonderful thing to be able to think, to be able to communicate, to be able to talk, to be able to write with the mind. It's a very, very useful thing. Use it fully, but don't get used by the mind. And the mind is telling you what to do. You tell the mind what to do. Now, since the soul never speaks, only the mind speaks, and the soul listens, how would you tell something to the mind? You are a listener, not a speaker, then how will you tell the mind something? You use the mind to tell the mind. But do not use the mind's will to tell what it wants to do. That will be mind's will. Therefore, the Creator has endowed us with the capacity to have more than one will. And we can distinguish between a spiritual will, which is carrying out the will of the soul, and a mental will carries out the will of the mind. And we have to distinguish between the two wills. And I tell you how to distinguish between the will of the mind and the will of the soul. Will of the mind always comes by thought. The mind thinks, I think we should do this, we do it, that's the mind's will. Mind is planning things, I want to plan all this, mind's will. Where the soul's will comes, where there is no thinking. When you know what to do without thinking, and it's called intuition, intuitive feeling, gut feeling, sudden feeling. This has to be done. Mind never thought about it. Mind is saying, don't do it. He says, I have to do it. That's the soul's instruction to the mind. Intuitive awareness that comes up. And when you are on the spiritual path, it will come up every day, several times. Ultimately, it will be your only guide to live your life. Then, use that intuitive will which is coming without thinking. Tell the mind to think on those lines and carry it out. Then, you are using spiritual will over the mental will. Otherwise, we are always using the mental will. We become slaves of the mind. The slave, the, such a good equipment given to us, like a mind. Beautiful, well-designed equipment. We can make full use of it. And instead of using it, we are being used by it. That's what's happened. Let's start using it. Use the mind to do what? What the intuitive feeling says. Now, intuition is a very interesting thing. Intuition comes without thought. You can't develop it. It's natural to the soul. Intuitive knowing is natural to the soul. And we know what to be done. And then, we don't do it. Mind reasons out, that's not reasonable, that doesn't make sense. And kills out our intuition. Therefore, we are living a lopsided life that the knowledge is there, what to do, and the mind is telling us don't, and we follow the mind. Follow the intuition. And make the mind do what the intuition is saying. Okay, are you confused? What is intuition or not? I've given you an explanation where there's time is, and thought is mind, where there's no time and no thought, there's intuition. If there's still not certainty, intuition is backed up by a strange phenomenon called coincidence. Coincidence is not an accident. When we say something is a coincidence, it's not happening by accident. It's a support to the intuition. What intuitively we feel, we have an intuitive feeling in the morning, we go and we see a billboard advertising something on the road, saying the same thing in part what our intuitive self was saying. We say, how can that happen? This was just what I thought. And that's what's happening there outside. So there's some message. What a coincidence it happened. That's what I felt. That's what I saw outside. Intuition is backed by external backing called coincidences. So if we are able to practice developing the mental will and the spiritual will separately, mental will for executing what the intuition says, intuitive will, spiritual will to decide what to do, to lead our life. If we 
put the things in the right place, life changes. Try it out. Try it out for a month and see the difference in your life. And then you adopt it for life. Very big difference. Then you're living a spiritual life. Then you're meditating day and night by living a spiritual life. How can we develop a stronger spiritual will? Very easy. Say no to the mental will. Not all the time. Sometime. To start with, say no to that spiritual, that mental will, which is pulling you the most. Mind is saying, I have to do this. Even your conscience, which is also another part of the mind, is saying, may not be a good idea. Mind says, go ahead, do it. Say no with the mind, no. Mind says only once, no. Okay, never again, no. If you can practice saying no to the mental will, spiritual will will grow, mental will goes down and the mind begins to adopt its correct role of being your servant and slave and follows what the intuitive will is saying. Then you can say, mind has come under control of a spiritual will. Otherwise, it's impossible to control the mind by just by thinking more about it. That's a mental function. Use intuitive will, your intuitive gut feeling to decide things and use the mind to carry it out. And Say no to the mind when it tries to do something three or four times a week to start with, three or four times a day later, and then it won't be necessary anymore. Your spiritual will will develop to that extent. So that is why I'm bringing this up, because it will help you in meditation in a very big way if you have developed your spiritual will and not going only into what the mind is saying, just thinking and going with what thoughts are coming in. Thoughts can be so random. Now, I don't know if we have time now. I'll take up the matter of how to know the mind a little better in meditation and identify it a little better so we can deal with it a little better when I see you in the afternoon for a while. And the final session will be tomorrow morning. I'll be very happy to complete this meditation workshop tomorrow. But uh, what we are doing now with love and devotion, very important part, and how to distinguish between the mind and yourself, important part. These are the most important parts today. I'll take up this matter in the afternoon. Enjoy your lunch. I'll see you about 3 o'clock again.